what are y'all doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so one, one quick story, golf story. So this uh, elderly man, we'll call him Jim, was about 85 years of age and he was an avid golfer. He had played golf almost every day since he'd retired about 20 years ago. But this one particular day he came home, he was very, very disgruntled, upset, angry, and his wife, Mabel, said, Jim, what's, what's wrong? He says, I cannot see the ball. I'm just going to have to quit. I cannot see the ball. Well, she was very sympathetic, fixed a cup of coffee for him, sat down and talked about it. She says, hey, I've got a great idea. Why don't we have my brother, Sid, go with you? He has excellent vision. And, and Jim said, well, but he's, he's 98 years old. But he has excellent vision. So he says, okay, we'll try this. So they go out the next day to the country club. Jim tees off, swacks away at it. And he turns to Sid and said, did you see it? He says, I've got excellent vision. I have excellent vision. And so Jim waits a little bit and he says, well, where is it? Where is what? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, that's it, that's all. <laughs> So a recap of last week, briefly. So we were talking about aging longevity. And to summarize, scientists, as you know, had really discerned the cause of aging after multiple experiments over time. And so once the cause had been determined, it had been so uh, there, there is another force here today. I hope you realize that. So after it had been determined what the cause of aging was, then it became common knowledge that aging is actually a disease. And as a disease, it's treatable. And so that then has led to a lot of research and a lot of information. And I discussed last week about lifestyle measures that influence aging, influence longevity genes. And those lifestyle measures, first and foremost, that we talked about are diet, particularly calorie restriction, fasting, talked about that, talked about the role of exercise in enhancing longevity genes. I did not mention, but meant to mention, High intensity exercise is very, very beneficial. You can cap off an exercise session by having about two minutes or so of high intensity exercise and that's particularly beneficial. We talked about sauna, uh, the health benefits of sauna. We talked briefly about cold exposures and as you know, Linda Ross and McDaniel is a proponent of cold showers and uh, we'll be happy to give some further discussion about that. So that's kind of a background. We talk about certain medications that are being used and a background to today. And there's an interesting concept that I'd like to relate to you. And that has to do with the fact that attitude about age, aging, age beliefs dramatically influence health, influence lifespans, influence health spans. Uh, how we think about aging impacts our health, our beliefs about aging play a role in determining how well and how long we live. Age beliefs, as I mentioned, affect the length of life, one of, of lives. One of the studies that I read had determined based on their research that life was extended seven and a half to eight years, healthy life on average by individuals that have a positive viewpoint of aging as opposed to those that have a negative viewpoint of aging. Older people with more positive perceptions about aging perform better physically, perform better mentally, better cognitively than those with negative perceptions. More likely to recover if an illness occurs, if a severe disability occurs, more likely to respond better to that. Walk faster. Individuals that have a positive attitude about aging simply are able to walk faster, which actually is a healthy thing. Walking slowly is a sign of, of health problems. Better balance. Individuals that have a positive health 
perspective have better balance. To an astonishing degree, age beliefs, positive age beliefs, can affect memory. The studies have shown that there can be as much as a 30%, 30% improvement in memory if there are positive beliefs about aging as opposed to negative beliefs. Age also influences the development of dementia, of Alzheimer's. Uh, people with negative age beliefs are more likely to develop the amyloid plaques and tangles that I've talked about in the past than those that have positive attitudes. Aging and, and positive aspects about aging affect how we respond to stress. This has been measured. Scientific studies have shown that cortisol, which is a hormone that responds in our body to stress, is actually increases about 30% in individuals that have a negative health belief, while it decreases about 10% in those that have a more positive uh, belief about aging. Positive beliefs bring better health, very simply. I've observed this a lot over the years in my practice in terms of individuals with heart disease and how they respond to it. Uh, positive beliefs go a long, long way. So what I'm going to head into next are some rules for a younger you. And actually I have a handout so that it make it a little bit easier. Maybe, uh, Frank, could you help me with, uh, yes, with a handout? And Kay, maybe you want to go, just kind of keep these a minute. I'm going to go through these um, after which we'll course had the test. <laughs> so rules for a younger, yes, I'm sorry, yeah maybe, I don't know, one per couple and see how we go as far as that's concerned uh, and so on. Um, anyway, one through eight rules. Rules for a younger you, plus two. So. The first rule has to do with blood pressure. What's an optimal blood pressure? An optimal blood pressure is 130 over 85 and less on a consistent basis. Body mass index in an optimal range of 22 to 25. An important measurement is actually a ratio of the waist measurement to your height that should be less than half, less than 50%. So how do we do with that? Everybody get a copy? If, if not, after this, there'll be some for sale for about $25 a uh, thing. So. Yeah, yeah. So go <laughs> going forward, fasting blood sugar, now these are numbers that you may or may not know, but they're important numbers because what I'm talking about now are measures that we can be doing and should be doing in order to do what we've talked about before, which is to avoid, prevent, delay illness from occurring so that we expand the health span. As a result of that can expand the total longevity span. Measuring blood cholesterol levels, the LDL. Well, national standards say it should be less than 100. I'm here to tell you but it should be 70 or less. That would be the optimal for prevention of cardiovascular disease. No tobacco metabolites in the urine, of course being tobacco free, and I think I'm preaching to the choir here. Stress management is an important part of being younger. Four components of physical activity uh, outlined here, at least 100 minutes of movement, staying active per day, uh, 10,000 steps a day that everybody knows about. Resistance exercises are important at least once a week, if not more. Uh, cardio, aerobic activity, at least three times a week. A good goal is at 80% of the age predicted maximum heart rate. Uh, 40 jumps a day, something simple to do if you don't have time. Speed processing games. There's a lot of speed processing games that are touted, that are marketed, and say brain development, so on. Most all of those are pure junk. There's a couple that have been scientifically analyzed, and they're kind of interesting. Double decision is one, freeze frame is another. These are available uh, on the internet. Eat salmon, eat mount ocean trout. 
wild salmon and ocean trout are really the only true sources of omega-3 fatty acids that are, I'll talk about in a little bit. Eat only when the sun is up. <laughs> so on a cloudy day, good luck. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's the idea of calorie restriction that I mentioned before. Calorie restriction triggers longevity genes. Fasting does the same thing. Uh, avoid snake oil foods. Well, we discussed those. Those are the processed foods, the red meats, the sugars, and that type of thing. Give sleep respect. Without a doubt, that's an important issue. Drink coffee, enjoy nuts, enjoy blueberries, uh, follow the Fab Eight. Now, what the heck is that? I'll talk about that in just a minute. I think it's a good idea for everybody here, once we've done this, is kind of stay up to date about longevity research. Uh, stay tuned to that in terms of what comes about because this is a rapidly changing area of research. Uh, enjoy an infrared sauna. 20 minutes, four days a week is proven in the scientific studies to have health benefits. S smell the roses, keep hearing the music, and do preventive measures that are routinely recommended by your physician. Keep your immunizations current. Those go without saying. I'm going to talk a minute about Alzheimer's. I've given previous uh, discussion about this, but kind of to review this because obviously this is something that impacts quality of life, impacts health span. There are eight lifestyle factors for Alzheimer's. Number one, midlife obesity. Number two, midlife high blood pressure. Blood pressure is above the optimal that I have mentioned. Physical inactivity is a risk factor for dementia and Alzheimer's, as is depression, as is smoking, as is diabetes, low education is, and finally hearing loss. So those are eight lifestyle risk factors for Alzheimer's, what the FAB8 refers to. And this is something that I gleaned from um, attending a conference with Dr. Rosen from the Cleveland Clinic that I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, he, I, he outlined the FAB8, in other words, these eight steps that you can take to uh, combat these lifestyle risk factors. Number one, Enjoy a plant-based nutrition with no red or processed meats, and each day have seven servings of fruits and vegetables. Hard to do, quite honestly. That's hard to do, but that's what's recommended. Two servings of whole grains, healthy oils from olive oil, or fatty fish, as I mentioned, wild salmon, ocean trout, and no added sugars or syrups in any foods. Number two, make sure to stay physically active. You know, this means not going to the gym for one, 30 minutes or one hour once a day and then being inactive the rest of the day. It means staying active throughout the majority of the day. Interact with friends and family. Be generous with volunteering. Get seven to eight hours of sleep a night. See your doctor regularly for checkups and so on. Seek help with depression management. Have hearing and vision checked. Be sure that they're uh, pristine. Both are sharp. Take classes. St keep the brain active. Take classes, go to lectures, play the speed of processing games that I mentioned, read books, uh, learn a new skill or hobby, and keep your brain awake. And so these are, I think, good guidelines. I mean, none of us can be perfect about these, but clearly uh, they're of value. So, any questions uh, about any of that? Michael. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly wh the why. That's uh, that's uh, um, interesting here. How the fish are fed. We have uh, the fish, the fisherman himself, <laughs> <laughs> Frank. It's how it's how they're fed. Well, yeah, which is probably true, Frank. Yeah, you know, has has to do with that. <laughs> yeah. Most of it all is farm raised. You know, if we go to a restaurant, go to Bodine's, or so, oh, you can get it. Well, so the other thing that's kind of interesting, and I don't have a handout on this because I didn't want everybody to just start doing all these things, but these are things that the researchers themselves do, uh, and Dr. Rosing. And I thought that that's pretty interesting because 
Um, so far, there are, for a lot of these things that I'm going to talk and, and mention, there are no hard, fast clinical trials uh, that prove uh, the value of some of these things that they are taking and I'm going to be talking about. Uh, doesn't mean that they're not effective, it just means that it hasn't undergone the scientific rigor that a lot of things do, like statins, for instance. Uh, so. A comment from one of the researchers that quotes, I know exactly what is going to happen to me if I don't do anything at all. In other words, as I age, I know what's going to happen to me, and it's not pretty. So what do I have to lose? Good statement, good thought. So they take NMN, which is a precursor of NAD, NAD, that I talked about last time, that is associated with uh, the energy supplied to uh, the longevity genes. They actually take resveratrol, uh, the substance that's found in red wine and, and some fruits, and they also take metformin. I talked about metformin last week, how that has been uh, observed to be associated with longer lives and is now undergoing a very rigorous uh, scientific trial, results of which are not yet available. These researchers, the majority of them, take a daily dose of vitamin D, vitamin K, and 81 milligrams of aspirin, baby aspirin. They keep sugar, bread, pasta at a minimum, as little as possible, they don't eat desserts. They try to skip one meal a day, the fasting concept that I've talked about. They miss lunch most of the days, that's how, how they handle that. They take a lot of steps each day, they walk and they jog and they lift weights, and they go to sauna, and then they immerse themselves in ice cold water. They do all those things because they, have, they know in their research laboratory that at least what they've learned so far is that it's a value. It's associated with uh, healthier lifespans in laboratory animals that are tested and some early human experience. They eat a lot of plants. They try to avoid eating other mammals. They try to stay on the cool side during the day and at night, and they keep their body weight in that optimum range of 23 to 25 that I've mentioned, the BMI, in that optimum range. Above 25 is overweight, 25 to 30 uh, is overweight, 30 to 40 is obese, and above 40 is morbidly obese. So, Dr. Rosen is a, uh, another one of these strange creatures called cardiologist, and he is at the Cleveland Clinic and he has been at the forefront of a lot of research and publication. Oh, whoop, did the sign go up? Okay, that are associated with, with uh, disease prevention, increasing lifespan. So what does he do? Well, he takes 12 different substances every day. One is vitamin D. Two, he takes half of a multivitamin twice a day. He takes calcium. 600 milligrams along with magnesium, 400 milligrams every day. He takes bovine colostrum, and I'll talk about that in a minute. He takes creatine, 5,000 milligrams a day. Coenzyme Q10, takes that on a daily basis. Takes curcumin, I'll talk about that. Takes DHA or uh, fatty acids. ASU, I'll talk about briefly. NR, which is again, the NAD precursor, and a substance called N-acetylcysteine. So he knows, based on his knowledge of research uh, and how he interprets that, is the benefit with taking these substances. So let me talk about vitamin D for a minute. Vitamin D is a lot more important than just thinking about bone health and preventing fractures. It has consequences that affect overall mortality, consequences that affect various types of cancer, breast, prostate, colon, melanomas, leukemia, cardiovascular disease, uh, autoimmune disorders, and some neurological disorders. It regulates many cellular functions. That's why it's so important. It has anti-inflammatory features. It has anti-cancer features. Uh, it affects muscle function. It affects brain health. Most of, not most of us, but a high percentage of Americans are actually deficient 
in vitamin D, about 35%. Uh, in some studies, and even up to 90% of individuals that have been studied have been found to be deficient in vitamin D. Yet you should get it tested and to see what level it's at. It's not naturally found in many foods. Uh, it is found in salmon again and uh, sardines, unless they're really fortified. So it is associated also, or deficiency of vitamin D is associated with cancer. Uh, it may increase the risk of cancer or death from cancer by up to 40% in some studies. They've compared vitamin D supplementation and higher levels uh, of vitamin D. In other words, if, if certain levels are achieved, then there has been shown to be a 60%, 60 decrease in the risk of, of any type of cancer, 50% lower risk of colorectal cancer. So what are the recommendations for vitamin D? Well, obviously get your level measured and aim for value that's somewhere between 50 and 80, at least above 35. Have you all done that? Do you all get vitamin D yeah. measured? Have any clue what it is? Some do, some don't. One hand, a lot of, a lot of people don't. 93%, well, heading on <laughs> to multivitamins. What about those? A lot of a lot of discussions about are they value, not a value, do they make your urine expensive, what does it do, and so on. So it's been determined that yes, they are of value. They have a, there are essential micronutrients that we cannot produce. And a lot of people may not get them in their diet. And so therefore, Dr. Rosen takes half of a multivitamin twice a day, as I mentioned. It's been postulated that 90 to 93% of Americans are missing more than about 50% of the recommended daily dose. It has effects in reducing all-cause mortality, cardiovascular disease, uh, morbidity and mortality from cancer. Uh, it slows brain aging. Multivitamins have been determined in studies to slow brain aging. So you have to be sure that obviously diet's well balanced, but if it's not, or if you're a vegetarian, then take Vitamin D is certainly recommended. Uh, it's thought to be an insurance policy against these chronic diseases that I've mentioned, Heart, cardiovascular disease, uh, cancer, uh, and uh, brain function abnormalities. He also takes calcium, 600 milligrams with 400 milligrams of magnesium, uh, maintains bone health, as you know, but it also maintains, again, brain health, it decreases colon and possibly other cancers. Uh, have to be careful. Taking too much increases the risk of prostate cancer. Magnesium is an interesting substance. A lot of times not routinely measured, but it should be. Uh, it, it's a role, it plays a role in enzyme uh, uh, metabolism and in, in an over about 60, 600 enzyme reactions that occur in the body are related to magnesium. And again, more than about 45% of Americans are deficient in magnesium. Uh, Long-term magnesium studies have been associated with higher rates of many of these age-related diseases that I talk about, uh, but there are also short-term symptoms of magnesium deficiency. They can be weakness, lack of energy, sleep disorders, cognitive disorders, and a lot of times these types of symptoms are attributed to the process of, quote, normal aging, unquote, when in fact, they could be related to magnesium deficiency. Again, what are the recommendations? One is to enjoy foods that are rich in magnesium, a lot of them, uh, almonds, cashews, peanuts, spinach, avocados, black beans, whole peanut butter, salmon, again, our friend salmon, and dark chocolate. What are the recommendations? Get your magnesium level checked once a year. Take a supplement if it's less than 2.1. You won't remember those numbers, but uh, you can find those out from your physicians, assuming that you have normal kidney function. So I'd like to talk a minute about aspirin, whether you should take it, not take it, and so on. There has been a lot of studies done including a meta-analysis which raised a lot of questions about whether aspirin should be taken or not. There's a lot of problems with that 
analysis. And the reason there are a lot of the problems is in the arm of the study in which people were taking aspirin, a high percentage were not actually taking the aspirin in the study. So it's very hard to prove an effect of aspirin if you don't take it. You heard it first here. Uh -huh. <laughs> so every year, there are about 600,000 first heart attacks. There's about 600,000 first strokes. I will tell you that I have seen heart attacks are always caused by a plaque in an artery of your heart that ruptures. As that happens, a clot forms. As the clot forms, that obstructs the flow of blood to the heart muscle, and that's what creates a heart attack. And of course, that's what I did. We would do heart catheterizations on people that came in with acute heart attacks, find that, see that there's a clot. Those individuals that were given aspirin uh, prior to my doing the procedure, you could see the clot start to dissolve and the flow of blood, blood start to increase. So what, what's, the, what's the data? The data says that there's anywhere from a minimum of about 14% reduction to 45% reduction in the occurrence of heart attacks taking aspirin. What about the thing that's not talked about a lot, but aspirin is a preventive for colorectal cancer. There's about 150,000 new cases of that every year. The best data says that is reduced 20 to 45% by taking aspirin. There's a total of about 1.8 million new cancers that are diagnosed every year in the United States. And the best data, taking aspirin, there's a 30 to 40% reduction in the risk of new cancers. What about the other side of the coin? What about adverse consequences of aspirin? And of course, bleeding is an adverse consequence. There are about, in the United States, about 20,000 deaths annually related to gastrointestinal bleeding. And the best data says that there is an increase in GI bleeding taking aspirin. There has been no increase in deaths. What about brain bleeds? Those happen to the tune of about 60 to 80,000 people per year. Uh, the best data says that risk increases about 22% taking aspirin, no increase in deaths. So what do we do? Assuming that there is one cardiovascular death prevented and one bleeding event that occurs and forgetting about the cancer benefit, then about 12.1% of men and a smaller percentage, 2.5% of women would benefit, taking into the bleeding account. What if we assume that we prevent one cardiovascular event and there are two bleeding events that occur, but we include cancer protection over 30% of men and 10% of women benefit. So taking all that into account, so what do you do? Well, the first thing is, is to check with your physician and assess is there a risk if you take aspirin and should you take aspirin. But the benefits, as they've outlined, seem to be greater than the risk, particularly for men over the age of 35, which I think affects a couple of you guys here. <laughs> <laughs> over the, and women over the age of 40, 45, or anyone who takes hormone therapy of any kind, testosterone, estrogen, progestin, but again, be sure to ask your physician. I take aspirin, 81 milligrams a day. Creatine, that's an interesting, interesting substance. It has the ability, I'm sure you're aware, to increase physical strength, been thought to be perhaps a performance enhancing drug, but the, the mechanism of action of creatine first was discovered in about the 1920s, and it's been better understood, I think, in recent years, particularly since the 1990s. It is increasingly being investigated for its ability to, again, affect many of these conditions of aging, including decreased brain and musculoskeletal health. So what are the key takeaways from research about creatine. Number one, it has increased muscle strength in elderly, no question. It's associated, therefore, with less disability and less aging. There is emerging data in both human trials and animal trials that indicate supplementation actually improves cognitive performance. And 
improves short-term memory. So there are some valuable benefits from that. It also has been, dis been demonstrated that it's effective in individuals that take antidepressant drugs. It enhances the uh, effect of those, and it limits the negative effects that occur with sleep deprivation. In other words, sleep deprivation creates problems, particularly uh, central nervous system problems. There are some other minor takeaways. Uh, it improves blood sugar, improves that hemoglobin A1C that I've talked about, improves sensitivity to insulin. Uh, it has been shown, in the laboratory at least, that it extends lifespan. This is in, in mice, and uh, the mice that were observed were considered more youthful. See it also running around, you'll know that it's been taking creatine. It may be a role in brain injury, certainly improves bone density. So what are the recommendations regarding creatine? If a person is a vegetarian, then certainly should consider adding salmon and or ocean trout, which are sources of creatine. Resistance exercises are value. And if you have inadequate sleep and worry about developing cognitive problems, then perhaps discuss with your physician the idea of taking a supplement of creatine. Another substance you probably have heard of because it's utilized a fair amount is coenzyme Q10. Uh, clearly it's been recommended for individuals that take uh, statins, uh, but it has a lot of other benefits. There's been a few studies reported recently and said that one study, the combination of that with another substance, selenium, in the normal elderly reduced the risk of cardiovascular disease by about 53%. A second study said the supplementation in patients with chronic heart failure reduced mortality. No significant adverse effects taking it. There has been a randomized controlled trial that compared the effectiveness of managing diabetes and what's associated with diabetes is uh, vascular dysfunction, uh, dysfunction of blood vessels, and it improved that. It improves kidney function in those individuals that have kidney disease. It reboots your age. Remember last time I talked about the great age reboot, that's kind of what we're talking about. Uh, 3.1 years younger for men, age 75, not so much for women, here we go, Th three years of benefit for women. But nonetheless, there seems to be coenzyme Q10 has a lot of positive benefits. So what are the recommendations for that? Take 200 milligrams, should be taken by all individuals over the age of 50, and all who are taking a statin, or have heart disease, have hypertension, have diabetes mellitus, and or have any neurological disorder, particularly any cognitive abnormalities. I'm sorry? Coenzyme Q10. Co or Co10. Co10. Co Co yeah. Coenzyme Q10. Co Q10. Yeah. Yes, Buzz. Not necessarily. It depends on what it is. <laughs> um, I think that as far as what I've talked about so far, I think probably not much difference among the brands. Uh, when we talk about omega-3 fatty acids, there is. And so I'll get to that in a minute because I'm going to talk about that. So, so it's hard to know 100% for sure, uh, but I think the ones that I've talked, obviously the vitamins, I talked about, I think the creatine that I talked about, that is probably pretty, pretty uniform across different brands. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, but I can't, how do you know for sure? You know, you don't know for sure, but you assume so, and I think that's a, a valid assumption. That's not true with, uh, uh, that I'll soon get right to. Uh, yes? Prescription 
blood thinner offer the same benefits and risks that uh, that that you just described before happened? No. No. No, they're different. They're d different mechanisms of action. Uh, and so uh, blood thinners that are prescribed for other conditions, for instance, atrial fibrillation, the rhythm disorder is a common reason that people take blood thinners because of the risk of clot. And so that does not um, have the same total benefits that aspirin does. So it does increase the risk if a person takes both then it does increase the risk of bleeding. Yeah. yeah. Does that answer that? It does, but I don't know about checking aspirin on chocolate. Yeah, yeah you'd totally have to check with your physician about that. I mean, some people do. I mean, we have reasons for uh, people to take uh, three different types of, of anticoagulants, clot preventers, and so on, but clearly, Clearly, the risk of bleeding is increased. No, no question about that. So here we go, curcumin. Interesting, interesting substance. Uh, it has antioxidant, uh, anti-inflammatory properties. It has neuroprotective properties, protects brain functions. As you know, it's been utilized a lot in India. And uh, Indians, East Indians who consume more curry, more curry had about one third the risk of dementia as those individuals, for instance, comparing them to Americans and comparing them to Europeans. The incidence rates of Alzheimer's, for instance, were about uh, 3.24 in individuals in India uh, per thousand people. In other words, uh, 3.24. Uh, incidence rates of all, Alzheimer's per thousand people in India compared to the United States where it's 17.5. So there seems to be a dramatic difference, at least in the incidence of this, uh, in comparison to populations that have curcumin in the diet and those that do not. There have been some randomized controlled clinical trials and it's been shown that cognitive function is improved Short-term memory is improved. Speed of processing, speed of processing information is improved in individuals that took curcumin compared to an age match uh, group that did not. Uh, Long-term memory was maintained longer in the group that took curcumin, whereas it tended to deteriorate in the placebo group. There was a decreased amount of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's the amyloid plaque and the tangles, a decreased amount of that was shown in those individuals that took curcumin or had it in their diet versus in comparison to those that did not did not. There are other benefits. It's because of its anti-inflammatory property, it helps with osteoarthritis. It reduces markers of inflammation. It improves uh, control of blood sugars. It will have an effect on decreasing LDL, cholesterol, that I talked about before, and it improves the function of blood vessels, what's called endothelial function. So what are their current recommendations regarding curcumin? If you have early cognitive decline or concern that you might, or if you have type 2 diabetes mellitus uh, or osteoarthritis, it is recommended to take it under a physician's supervision recommended with what's called uh, piperine, uh, or there's a substance called theracumin uh, that includes that. Uh, to date, even though there's these studies that have these positive benefits that I have mentioned, to date there's no, no long-term clinical trials that say everybody on the planet should take it, but clearly there seems to be benefit to that. Now we head to the omega-3 fatty acids and I'll get to your question there, Buzz, in a little bit. Uh, a lot of issues about omega-3 fatty acids uh, certainly is an important part of all membranes in the cells in our body. It's found in all tissues. It facilitates the neural transmission from one synapse to another. Uh, it, uh, again, is associated with uh, speed of processing of information. Plays a big role in eye health. 
uh, the highest rates of omega-3 fatty acid intake are, are excuse me, the, the highest intake is inversely correlated with age-related macular degeneration. In other words, the higher the omega-3 fatty acid intake, the lower the chance of developing uh, a common cause of blindness. It also is effective amazingly in dry eye syndrome. Uh, it's been shown in some studies that individuals that have a high amount of omega-3 fatty acids in their diet actually are protected against having dry eye syndrome, which is not an inconsequential issue. Uh, it decreases the buildup of toxic substances in, in the eye uh, and the higher intake, uh, even if a person has developed age-related macular degeneration, it slows the process of it so that it doesn't progress as fast. Does it have a role in cardiovascular health? Seems to, seems to uh, lower triglycerides, uh, seems to uh, increase the good cholesterol, HDL, seems to affect the particle size of the LDL, which is an important thing. It has been associated with a reduction of blood pressure, has anti-clotting effects. Uh, a meta-analysis of taking omega-3 fatty acids has shown that there is a decreased uh, morbidity uh, from in cardiovascular disease, uh, uh, certainly associated with populations of people that have uh, an accelerated amount of fish intake in their diet. And so even though there's, there's controversy, I think recent controversy uh, regarding the role of omega-3 acids has been, fatty acids has been all over the map. I think what I'm saying right now is probably a constellation of all of that of that information. Um, the other thing that I think is important is, is that uh, there's strong data that support a relationship between uh, improved cognitive function, again, and increased omega-3 fatty acid intake. Um, it, in fact, is associated with about a 40 percent reduction in the risk of all-cause dementia, dementia any kind, but particularly vascular, what's called vascular dementia. Um, so, pill form. The pill form that's important has DHA in it, and it's actually derived from, from algae. And so, um, not all of the substances actually have DHA in them that are touted as omega-3 fatty acids, so that's, that's, that is the difference uh, there. Uh, and it's important if you're interested in taking that, that it's important to be sure and to get the DHA form of omega-3 fatty acid. There is a, a, a one thing to mention there, there's a slight increased risk of the rhythm disorder atrial fibrillation taking uh, DHA. So, um, important issue. One other th substance that's taken that Dr. Rosen takes is NAD, the precursor to uh, um, well, that is NAD, or precursor to NAD. Uh, it clearly plays a role in cellular energy, uh, plays a role in, in the longevity genes, as I've mentioned. It is sold commercially to substances. One is called basis, the other is called true niogen, which is an oil precursor to NAD. As we age, the levels decline. And since an important substrate for the sirtuins that I mentioned last week, which are the uh, longevity genes that play a role in DNA uh, repair, it's been hypothesized that replacing uh, NAD will actually slow the aging process. More than 100 preclinical trials have investigated the science of all this, and there's extensive evidence that says uh, that's known about the cellular mechanisms and the physiologic effects of supplementation, at least in animal models. There are currently about 40 registered trials uh, in evaluating this, trying to translate the previous research to human health. And so that's eagerly awaited. As I've mentioned, the researchers and Dr. Rosen uh, include this in their daily uh, regimen. So I think that's something to keep an eye on. Um, most physicians probably are not going to be recommending that. Uh, I'm not sure there's any downside to that. So that uh, pretty much
prematurely, but that's fine, concludes, <laughs> that's more than I know, <laughs> actually. <laughs> so so uh, after two weeks of this, I think you'll see that uh, this is an amazing area of attention, investigation, research by hundreds of brilliant scientists. Uh, as I read about all this and learned about a lot of this, I got excited about it because I think there is a real potential future. I mean, you think, well, what happens so, so people live better and live longer? What's that going to do to cultures? What's that going to do to economics and so on? Well, that's been evaluated at least, and so it actually may prove to be beneficial. Uh, if people stay healthier longer, they're not going to consume medical resources that are being consumed currently. Uh, we have this unsustainable increasing uh, demand for medical care, increasing costs, and so uh, it will probably favorably impact that and have a very positive effect on that, uh, have a positive effect on economies. So, kind of the last thing to say is not <laughs> scientific, but I think uh, has, a, has a lot to um, say, and these are actually uh, steps on how to stay young. And these are actually from George Carlin, whatever you may have thought about him. I <laughs> but I always thought he was a fairly astute and sensitive observer of the human condition. And so, at least that's my bias. This is for the first time I'm tossing in some bias here, I think. Well, one, keep only cheerful friends. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's, as I mentioned about the mental attitude, uh, positive attitude toward aging and, and so on is beneficial in a lot of ways. Number two, keep learning. And I've discussed about that. He says, learn more about whatever. Uh, that, you, that you want to. Number three, enjoy the simple things. Um, good advice, laugh. Laugh long, laugh loud, laugh until you gasp for breath. Tears happen. Endure, grieve, and move on. The only person who is with us our entire life is ourselves. Be alive while you are alive. Surround yourself with what you love. Pets, friends, keepsakes, music, plants, hobbies. Your home is your refuge. Cherish your health. I mean, that's been, you know, David uh, Emery in some of his lessons, he says, or brings up the idea in some of his sermons, says, why are you here? And so this is the reason that I'm here, and I've been doing this for the last two weeks, is because I'm interested in your health. I'm interested in trying to tell you things that I suspect you don't normally hear or read about and have you think about these things and investigate these things. Cherish your health. Tell the people you love that you love them. Do it at every opportunity. He says, always remember, life is not measured by the breaths we take, but by moments that take our breath away. That's all I got. <laughs> oh, questions, yeah, oh, we got, woo -hoo. I'm sorry? I guess I have no feelings, I don't know. <laughs> Oh, is that right? Yeah. And you know, th that never came up in any of the research. I, mean, I, I have, uh, have read more than two things. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so it never came up. That's interesting. I mean, does he have evidence behind it, science behind it? Or, uh, you know, like everybody else, he studies on the Internet. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, so I don't know. I'm a total, yeah, yeah. Betty. <laughs> A 10? S? Maybe. No? No? 
<laughs> unless, unless, unless I forgot. Way, yeah, in the back, Connie. Yeah, well, what's happened is, is yes. I mean, exposure to sun increases uh, vitamin D, but the issue is, as you know, um, concern about skin cancer with exposure to sun and also the use of um, um, skin protection uh, lotions, you know, with the use of that. And those two things are the chief reason why uh, there's such a high percentage of individuals with low uh, serum or blood calcium levels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah. Yeah, you can't get it from your daughter. You can get it from your... Oh, I've seen your... <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, probiotics, that's a good question. Um, there's a question about or the question specific is what about probiotics? And, and so that's a good point to be raising because there is an association between the microbiology of the gastrointestinal tract and diseases, even uh, diseases such as Parkinson's. And so uh, that is a valuable thing. I'm not an expert on that. I just know that, that that's important and that having uh, the appropriate microbiology in your GI tract is, is a healthy thing, right? Yes. Um, what's your opinion of the thing about these over-the-counter brand meds like Evagen or something like that that, you know, you're here constantly on TV? Mm -hmm. I have a real negative opinion about that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's that. <laughs> so, no, those things have been... Um, evaluated and the problem is is that there is no scientific basis whatsoever to say that it improves cognitive function that it has any positive effect on treating managing uh, dementia specific at Alzheimer's and so um, billions of dollars are being spent on that uh, and it has a lot of marketing to it I mean you have to be very 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 careful about marketing that is done and so that's one area that I think is doing a big disservice. Oh uh, no, it's not a weird question, and and it's not a weird answer. And the answer is yes. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it should be measured. I mean, that's that's. That's a take-home message as far as vitamin D is concerned. It's an important, important uh, vitamin, as you can see, and it should be measured. Um, there was some other, yeah, Betty. <laughs> you can, Betty, for you today, I have a special. And that special for $500, you can get one of those <laughs> if, if you get it within the next 30 minutes. So, no. No, uh, you know, I, I didn't do that because, here's why, and, and I think I mentioned that I don't want, what I don't want here is, that, you know, I'm not practicing medicine here today, I'm relaying information. And so I want you to have the information, and I want you to discuss that information with your doctor. I don't want you to take each of those things there and, and go, go to CVS and start taking those right away. And, and, and by the way, uh, there may be a cut rate price on that for you, I'll see. Uh, Mark, the, uh, your, your advice about taking the, like a multivitamin uh, half dose is, is that because of the water soluble vitamins like twice a day? Yeah, I think it's related to absorption and, and blood levels, and that's why it's twice a day. Dr. Rosen takes the aspirin twice a day with the warm water, as you see. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Meredith. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a pretty good question because that's, uh, well, in fact, that's, that's a really good question. Uh, it is important because taking sleep medications have short-term benefits and long-term harm, all of them do, including melatonin. And so there's some reports out about some adverse uh, cognitive issues that have occurred with taking melatonin for a long period of time. So, so for the most part, uh, if, if you have to take one, then the lowest dose of melatonin, I guess, would be a reasonable recommendation, but to try not to take it forever, but to use the other sleep hygiene things that I've mentioned before. So that leaves you in a quandary because it raises a concern about them, but I think that's an appropriate concern. So I wouldn't, if possible, not depend on a sleep aid. That's the best health advice. Okay, thank you so much.